Okay, we're going to look at an example here where we're going to find local extrema and saddle points for this multivariable function. So in a previous video, we looked at that theorem, a uh, statement of that theorem that talked about that. So we'll look at this, use the theorem in this problem. Um, so the first thing we want to do, just like when you were in Calculus 1, is find the critical points of the function. And the critical points would be the points where uh, the derivatives, in this case all of the derivatives, are zero or does not exist. So we want to start by finding uh, the gradient vector. So remember your gradient vector is just going to be your partial derivatives with respect to x and y. Uh, since I just have a function of two variables here. So uh, we'll go ahead and write that down for this one. Um, so our partial derivatives here are pretty straightforward. Uh, we'll get 1 third times 3, so 1x squared, 0, minus 2x, minus 3 for our partial derivative of f with respect to x. And then partial of f with respect to y, uh, derivative of this term will be 0. Here we'll have 4 thirds times 3, so 4y squared. Derivative of these two terms with respect to y will be 0, and then minus 4, and derivative of that term will be 0. Okay, so what we're interested in is when this gradient vector is 0 or does not exist. So uh, this gradient vector, this we started here with the polynomial function. That polynomial function is differentiable everywhere. Uh, so there are no places where our derivative would not exist. So in this case, we're really just looking for where our derivative is the 0 vector. Uh, so when the gradient vector is the zero vector, that would mean all of the derivatives in all directions, all the directional derivatives would be zero. So I'm interested in this. A lot of times when I do these problems, I actually skip right to what I'm going to write next. Uh, and that is that if I found this gradient vector and I'm setting it equal to zero, really what I'm doing is setting each partial derivative equal to zero. And so often I'll just skip to that step where I've got the partial derivatives equal to zero. So in the next example, we'll just start with this step. And then what I'm looking at here is solving a system of equations. So uh, you're just leveraging some algebra skills, but I want to point out something about the algebra uh, in those situations. So in this particular problem, you might notice that the partial derivative with respect to x ended up involving only x and constants, and the partial derivative with respect to y ended up involving only y. And so I've got equations here. It's really a system of equations because I need both of these components to be zero. So I need to solve this as a system. But in this system, the equations do what we call decouple. So they separate out here. I don't have either of these equations that has both variables in it. So it feels like you're solving these equations separately, like you just have an equation involving x and an equation involving y. The important thing to remember, though, is that your solutions to this system would be ordered pairs, x, y. And so thinking about that. In the next example, we'll look at one where the equations do not decouple. And we'll emphasize how the algebra is a little bit different uh, when you do that. OK, so for this one, though, the algebra is pretty straightforward. Both of these equations factor pretty easily or very easy to solve for x and y. Uh, so I'm just going to talk through the algebra and not write it all out here to save some space. Uh, here, I could factor this into x minus 3 times x plus 1, set each factor equal to 0, and I will get x equals 3 and x equals negative 1 from this first equation. The second equation, I could divide through by 4 if I want, uh, since 4 is a common factor here. And then I'd get y squared minus 1 equals 0. I could either factor that or add 1 to both sides and square root both sides. If you square root, you have to be careful, though. Make sure you don't miss a solution. Get two solutions, degree two polynomial. You should expect two solutions. You'll get y equals plus or minus 1 for that. OK, so again, remembering that as a system, I need both of these equations to be true. And so my solutions to this system of two equations and two variables 
are going to be ordered pairs. So um, this equation here about our gradient vector being equal to zero will be true when either x is 3 and y is either of these values, or when x is negative 1 and y is either of these values. So in this case, when these equations decouple like this, I don't have a particular y value depending on x being one or the other of these. And so in this case, I really have four critical points for this multivariable function. When x is 3, y could be either of these. And when x is negative 1, y could be either of these. All right, so I'm going to list my critical points here in a table, and then we're going to do some classification of those critical points to determine whether they give us maxima or minima or saddle points. So this is not the way your textbook organizes this, but I find that it hel is helpful to students to kind of organize their work and what they're doing here. So I'm just going to make a little chart here. And in the first column, I'm just going to list my critical points. I have four of them here. Uh, when x is 3 and y is positive 1, when x is 3 and y is negative 1, and then when x is negative 1 and y is 1, and when x is negative 1 and y is negative 1. Okay, so I've got my critical points here, and then what I want to determine is whether at these critical points I have a local maximum, a local minimum, or neither. Uh, and then we need to make sure that we also answer the question in exactly the way it's asked. All right, so in order to classify what's happening at these points, in Calculus 1, you looked at the sign of the derivative, perhaps, on either side of the critical point. The issue for multivariable functions is you've got infinitely many sides all around that critical point. So again, in Calculus 1, you might have used first derivative test, so looking at the sign of the derivative on either side, or you might have used second derivative test, where essentially you're looking at the concavity of the function at the critical point. So in the theorems that we looked at, that's essentially what we're going to use here. The reason we can't use a first derivative test is because we have infinitely many sides of that critical point to think about what the function might be doing, whether it's increasing or decreasing on different sides. So we're going to look at the concavity which is involved with the second derivative, but we also need to consider that in all directions. So that's what that d function represents. You want to make sure that you can write down what that d function is eventually so that you know how to classify these. Uh, so I'm going to write the formula for that up here. Um, so it's the product of the second pure partials, so fxx times fyy minus the product of the mixed second partial derivatives. So the partial derivative, second partial derivatives where I do one with respect to x and then with respect to y. For functions where this test works though, those mixed partial derivatives are equal. Clairaut's theorem applies, so we often write that as fxy, the quantity squared. All right, so you want to be able to write that down. At first, you might have to look at your notes to remember that, but after you do a few problems, most students have an easy enough time remembering this product of the pure second partials minus product of the mixed second partials. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and write that down for this particular function here. Uh, this D stands for the discriminant or maybe a determinant. It is really a determinant of a matrix. And I don't want to simplify these too much because all I'm really interested in here is whether this is positive or negative or perhaps zero. Uh, and that'll tell us what's going on at or around those points. Okay, so fxx, so I can use my work from over here. Partial, here's my first partial derivative with respect to x, so now I need to take the derivative of that with respect to x. So I'll get 2x minus 2. fyy, so I need to take the derivative of this with respect to y. So I'll get 8y minus, and then our mixed second derivative. So in this problem, because this function and all of its derivatives are going to be continuous everywhere, I know that these mixed second partials should be equal to each other, so I can do either way. Here I've differentiated first with respect to x, and then if I find the derivative of that with respect to y, in this case, that will be just be 0. Okay, and what I'm interested in here at each of these critical points is not so much what the answer to this is, as whether the answer is positive or negative. Uh, if, remember in that theorem, if this answer turns out to be zero, it means that this does not discriminate between maxima and minima, and you just can't use this theorem. Uh, 
So hopefully we end up with a positive or a negative here. Uh, if not, then we would need to use some other method to determine uh, whether we have extrema or saddle points. All right, so when I put in these points, I'm not going to simplify too much because, again, I'm really just interested in positive or negative. So when I put in x equals 3, 2 times 3 minus 2, I'll go ahead and simplify that. 2 times 3 minus 2 is 4. And then when I put in y equals 1, I get 8. 4 times 8 is positive. Okay, so what that tells me, uh, and this part, I started with this problem in particular because that mixed second derivative turns out to be 0. If you can think about what the second pure partials represent, what they really represent is actual concavity in the direction parallel to the x-axis or parallel to the y-axis. So when both of these are positive, uh, that means that I've got second derivatives in both the x-slice of the graph and the y-slice of the graph that are positive, which would indicate that my function is concave up. Right, so it's the same in both directions. I've got concave up and concave up. And so because that second derivative is positive, that tells us that our critical point, because that function is going to be concave up in that region around that critical point, that our point, I'm going to put that here. The theorem does not say that, but that's what that means. Uh, that means that our, if the function's concave up everywhere around that point, then that critical point is the location of a minimum. Okay, so we're going to do the same thing just with these other critical points here. Uh, when I put in 3, I'll get 4 again, and then when I put in negative 1, I'll get negative 8. Okay, so these second pure partials represent concavity. It's telling us that at this point, if I look in the x direction, the graph is concave up, but if I look in the y direction, the graph is concave down. And so that's a typical kind of problem where we looked at with the Pringles earlier in the semester that you have what's called a saddle point. So the key thing here is that this is negative. I've got a positive times a negative. The theorem talks about when that d function is negative, that tells you that you have a saddle point. The reason it tells you that is because you have different concavity in different directions. Um, okay, then when I put in negative 1, 1, I get 2 times negative 1 minus 2, so negative 4. And when I put in 1, I get 8. So again, I get a negative for this d function. I have different concavity and different directions, so a saddle point. And then when I put in negative 1, negative 1 into my d function, here I'll have negative 4 times negative 8. That product is positive. The statement of our theorem says that when this product, when this d function is positive, that means you have an extrema, right? So when that d function turns out to be positive, that means you have an extrema, a maximum or a minimum. And how you decide what kind of extrema you have is by thinking about the concavity. The statement of the theorem talks about the second pure partial with respect to x. But if this product, if this d function is positive, then these will both be the same sign. So really, you could look at either one. Uh, positive tells us we have an extremum, a maximum or a minimum. And then looking at the sign of the second pure partial with respect to x, that's what the theorem says, uh, tells you what type. So both of these are negative. That tells you that the function's concave down in both the x and y direction. I'm going to put that here. The theorem doesn't talk about that, but that's y. And so that tells you that that point gives you a max at that point. You do have an extremum, a max or a min, not a saddle point. But in order to determine what type, you have to look at the sign on that second pure partial with respect to x. Or you could look with respect to y. But our theorem focuses on the second pure partial with respect to x. OK, so at this point, I've essentially done all of the work to answer the question. But I do need to pay attention to how the question is asked to see if I need to do some additional work just to write my answer for what it's asking here. Um, all right, so it's asked us here to find the local extrema. So I've done all the work to identify where the local extrema are. But if you recall, if you go back and look in Calculus 1, and then also in this class when we looked at the definition of what it means to be a local maximum or a local minimum, that extrema is really an output value highest output, lowest output. Uh, 
So technically I've done all the work here, but what I don't have is output values for the function. I do know that the minimum, local minimum for the function should occur when I put this in for the input, but these are x, y values, and so I need to find the output at that point. All right, so I'm just gonna go down here and write that for my answer here. Uh, sometimes I'll add that as another column over here, but I'm kind of out of space on my screen here. Uh, all right, so we have a local minimum, and that's gonna be the output of the function at this point. So I put three one into my original function. I do the arithmetic and I wrote those down so I don't have to <laughs> do that computation here in my head. Uh, we put three one into this function and I get uh, negative 44 thirds. Okay, so the local minimum is negative 44 thirds. That would be my answer for the local minimum. I could say where it occurs. It occurs at 3, 1. Uh, the local maximum would be f of negative 1, negative 1. So I put negative 1, negative 1 into my original function and do some calculating. Uh, and I get 4 thirds. And that occurs at this point, negative 1, negative 1. And then for the saddle points, technically when you think about a point on a function graph, you're probably thinking about an ordered triple in this case. So our textbook writes saddle point answers as ordered triples. It kind of depends how the question is asked, whether you might just identify the input values that give the saddle points or whether they really want that answered as an ordered triple. With the way this is worded here, thinking about a point on a function, you're gonna be thinking about the input and output values. So in this case, since our input's two var variables, the output would be the Z coordinate, we'd have an ordered triple. Uh, all right, so the saddle points, I'll just abbreviate here. Saddle points are gonna be at, so one of them will be at three, negative one, and then I'm gonna find the Z coordinate of that function when I put in three, negative one here. I get negative 28 thirds. And then the other one will occur when I'm at negative one, one for the X and Y values when I put those into my function and simplify, I get negative four. Okay, the other thing that's important about how I've written my answers here is that I've got really four answers for this problem and so it's important that you have some labels so it's clear which answer is for which part. All right, we're gonna go look at this on the graph. Okay, so here I've graphed our function. Uh, so I've got z equals one third x cubed plus four thirds y cubed minus x squared minus three x minus four y minus three. And I've plotted all of our points here, our saddle points and uh, the extreme. Uh, uh, I had to adjust the window a little bit, so it took me a little while to get this set up so that we could see everything in the window here um, because our maximum value is positive and the minimum value is pretty low, negative 44 thirds, so down there around negative 15. So it took a little bit of adjusting, so if you type this in, it might just take you a few minutes to get this, the uh, window set up so you can see everything at once here. Um, but I just want you to look at this a little bit. So I've got my maximum value uh, four thirds at negative one, one. So you can see that I highlighted that point. I made a big point here in yellow so we can see that maximum value. Looks like it's here at the top of a hill. So that's what you expect a maximum to look like just from Calc 1, kind of looking like it's at a peak. Uh, I have a minimum value, rotate this around, minimum value right here where I'm pointing with the cursor right now, down here of negative 44 thirds, that's the Z coordinate. Um, at x equals three and y equals one. So there's our minimum value and that's what you would expect a minimum value to look like at the bottom of a, bottom of a valley there. Um, but the other two points, the saddle points, are maybe a little different than you might uh, think about. So I'm just gonna, I've got those also highlighted in yellow. There's one right here. And one important thing is to think about, so when I look at that kind of from one viewpoint, it looks like a low point but when we rotate the graph around the other way, you can see that that same point is kind of a high point from that direction. So a saddle point, or that looks like those, 
uh, hyperbolic paraboloid graphs that we drew that look like Pringles that we drew a little bit earlier in the semester. So saddle at that point. And then there's another one over here. Uh, this other one over here would be 3, negative 1, negative 28 thirds. Uh, that you can see that looks like a saddle point over there as well. So you don't have to graph them when you do these problems, but it can be helpful if you want to look at that to kind of see what the points look like. Um, just remember that it can be hard to kind of set up that window if you want to see everything all at once. It might be easier to kind of zoom in near a particular point if you want to see that as well. All right, we're going to look at some more examples in another video.